Polymorphism, based on its Latin root, basically means many forms or many shapes. And this kind of stands to reason because the idea is that what appears to be a single method or a single member may actually have multiple different implementations depending entirely on the context of how that particular member is called. Now, this may go a little bit further than just using the same method name in a number of different classes, but we can actually tie those elements and implementations together so that the most appropriate implementation may be used in, uh, for example, an array or a set of elements or collection, etc. This really increases the flexibility of your code because what that means is that you're free to call that member as you wish and have a confidence that the implementation that's provided will be appropriate for the type of object that you're actually working with. Now, it's important to understand before we go any further into polymorphism some basic concepts of how objects are instantiated. First of all, we have to understand that an instance of a subclass is always going to be an instance of its base class. If you remember our earlier discussions of instantiation and inheritance, we stated that when you create an instance of a class, what you're actually creating is a chain of objects. You're creating an instance of that subclass and then its parent classes all the way up to the base class object. So every single class instantiation actually creates an instance of a set of classes. Now, because an instance of a subclass is always an instance of its base class, that means that you can freely cast between these different types. Assuming, for example, that we have a class called Poodle that derives from a class Dog. If I created an instance of a Poodle, then that might be castable into a Dog and vice versa. Notice the code here in this example. The variable P1 is typed as of type Dog. The name of the class is dog. Can I store a new instance of a poodle class into the variable p1 if p1 is typed dog? Well, yes, I can, because a poodle is a dog. So that means that when I create an instance of a poodle class, an instance of a dog class, its base class, will automatically be created. Therefore, p1 is implicitly castable to dog. Could I do this the other way around? If I create a poodle, P2, can that be an, hold an instance of, an, of a class dog? Can I do a P2 equals new dog? Well, in this case, I might have a problem because poodle is a very specific type of dog. Now, technically, if I create an instance of a dog, it could be a poodle, it could be a bulldog, it could be a terrier. There could be a number of different types of dogs that we're actually talking about. So while every poodle is a dog, not every dog is a poodle. I think you can probably see how this works now. So the creation of that subclass automatically implies its castability into its base class, but it doesn't necessarily go the other way around. What if I did have a poodle? Could I cast that specifically to a poodle even if it was storing an instance of a dog? Well, sure. Let's say that I had this P3 and P3 is identified as a Poodle class. Could I set that equal to a Poodle cast of P1? Well, remember, P1 is actually a dog. Can P1 be cast to a Poodle? Yes, because you'll notice that P1 is actually storing an instance of the Poodle class. Therefore, since P1 is a Poodle, P1 can be cast to a Poodle. So this uh, concept of casting actually has an important play in the implementation of polymorphism, which we'll see here in a minute. Now, some other things we should consider before we dive into some code. First of all, you can create arrays of base class types and then load instances of those subclasses into the base class types. So for example, could I create an array that's typed dog? and inside the elements of the array store instances of poodles, bulldogs, and terriers. Absolutely. So that array then becomes a point of commonality. I'm going to be using a data type that is common to all of those elements. Since bulldogs, terriers, and poodles are all dogs, they can each be stored inside an array of dogs. Now, if you have a method that is defined at the dog level but implemented within each individual subclass, 
Therefore, which implementation will actually be called? Let's say, for example, that in the dog class, we define a method called bark. And we're assuming that every different type of dog barks a little bit differently. So each dog has its own implementation of that bark class, or the bark method. Poodles bark differently than bulldogs. So if I scroll or iterate through that collection or that array, which implementations of that bark method will actually be called? Well, that will depend on the actual type of subclass that's loaded into that element of the array. Therefore, what we're seeing here is that different elements of the same array might exhibit different behaviors depending on the actual subtype of element that's stored within that particular element of the array.